Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and get started with this next topic of the five precepts, a householder's guide to daily practice. So welcome back to all of you guys. This is a teaching from the Buddha where you're going to start to understand the natural law of gamma more clearly because what he's exposing to you is this cause and effect or action and result. He's going to help you see some wise decisions that you can make that's going to produce wholesome results in your life. Sometimes when people study the five precepts, they try to look at them like as rules or commandments. And you might even hear like very rudimentary translations where people say that the Buddha taught no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no lying, no intoxicants but he actually didn't teach that. He doesn't talk that way. He doesn't teach that way. He doesn't list things as like rules or commandments. He shares guidance with you to help you be able to see the natural law of gamma more and more clearly. So I'm going to use the original words of the Buddha to be able to help you see and understand what these five precepts are. But as I teach you, just remember that everything that you're learning is based on this natural law of gamma, of cause and effect or action and result, the results of your decisions. It's your life it's your decisions, it's your results. This isn't mystical or magical. It's not punishment and rewards. It's not about who's at blame or who's at fault. It's about awakening to the understanding of this natural law about how things truly are in the world so that you can see more and more true reality. So when you see the words of the Buddha, you should look at them in that way that he's exposing you to this natural law. It's not black and white. There's this large gray area that I'm going to help you to navigate. So let me help you to understand these five precepts. This is the first one using the original words of the Buddha. He says, abandoning the taking of life, refraining from taking life without stick or sword, diligent, compassionate, trembling for the welfare of all living beings. So here, what he's teaching you is to cultivate compassion for all living beings. Notice if you're studying the teachings of the Buddha and you're investigating and examining his teachings that he's using this term living beings. Well, the very first thing you should ask yourself is what's a living being, right? You need to know what's a living being. How do you classify a living being? If you're going to live compassionately for all living beings, you need to know what a living being is. Well, the Buddha teaches a teaching called the five aggregates, also referred to as the five collections or the five elements. This is where he describes what a living being is. And this is something that you can learn as you go forward in your journey to enlightenment. I'll be teaching it in this retreat coming up on the 21st through the 26th. And in other courses and programs, I teach the five aggregates. But just basically, I'll share them with you. What the five aggregates are is form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. These are the five things or the five elements or the five collections that make a living being a being. A living being is going to have physical form. That's the first aggregate. They're going to have feelings. Those are the pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neither painful nor pleasant. Then they're going to have perceptions. What a perception is, is like a view or opinion, the way that they look out at the world and they kind of view the world through their perceptions. Then a living being is going to have volitional formations. This is choices and decisions. A living being is going to have free will to be able to make choices and decisions. And then the fifth aggregate is the consciousness, which is the mind itself. So a living being is going to have form, physical form, feelings, perceptions, which are views and opinions, how the world is, 
then it's going to have choices and decisions, which are volitional formations and a consciousness of the mind. So you can independently reflect on this and you can see that you have all five of those aggregates because you know you're a living being, right? And you can look at all five of those things and be like, yep, I have those things. And then you can look at things like a bird, a cat, a dog, a cheetah, a monkey, a squirrel. All these things have all five aggregates. But then you can look at something like this chair that I'm sitting in. It has physical form, right? When you say it has physical form, but does this chair have feelings? Does it have perceptions? Does it have volitional formations? Because it choose to pick itself up and walk down the street and put itself somewhere else? And does it have a consciousness? No, it doesn't have those five things. That's why it's not a living being, right? So you can look at the world through these five aggregates and the Buddha is helping you to understand what a living being is. And you'll learn this more in depth as you go forward on the path to enlightenment. But if you're looking for kind of an easy way to just kind of get started with understanding what a living being is, you might use this here, that a living being has comes from an egg, a sperm, and a consciousness, that you would see these things, that it's going to be born through an egg, through a sperm, and a consciousness. But this isn't true for all living beings. So that's why it's important to know the five aggregates. But this will at least get you started with understanding what a living being is. And this is where you can understand that plants and bacteria or viruses, these aren't living beings, where we oftentimes use language in the unenlightened state that doesn't represent true reality. We might say that I'm going to kill this bacteria or I'm going to kill this virus, but you're not really killing the virus or bacteria. It's not a living being. You're eliminating that bacteria from the body or you're eliminating that virus from the body, or you're not really killing that tree. You're not really killing the broccoli, that plant of broccoli. You're harvesting that apple. You're harvesting that tree. So we oftentimes use language that leans to us unknowing of true reality and having this confusion in the mind. So part of getting to enlightenment is to clarify what it is that you're really doing in the world and using vocabulary that represents that. So while some people might consider a tree to be alive, it's not alive in the sense of being a living being. It doesn't have all five aggregates. A tree has physical form, but it doesn't have feelings. It doesn't have perceptions. It doesn't look out at the world in a certain way with views and opinions. It doesn't have volitional formations. It doesn't have choices and decisions. It can't choose to pick itself up, walk down the street and replant itself. And it doesn't have a mind or a consciousness. So this is how you can determine what a living being is. So then if you understand this precept and at least what the Buddha is sharing with you, then you might start looking at, well, what is an intentional killing? All of these things are intentional killings. A euthanasia of human or animal, termination of pregnancy, suicide, assisted suicide, capital punishment, war, government-sponsored killings, murder. These are all intentional killings. But whether you choose to do these things or not, it's your choice. The Buddha isn't telling you what you should or shouldn't do. He's exposing you to the natural law of gamma, that as you choose to do certain things, then there's going to be certain results as part of that. So you can take these things and you can look at them and you can reflect on them and realize that what the Buddha is teaching you here is to live compassionately for the welfare of all living beings. He's not teaching you to preserve all life at all cost. So let's take something like termination of a pregnancy, where some people think of this as a political issue. I don't think of it as a political issue. It's a human issue. It's something that we have the technology to do. And in some situations, maybe somebody might decide to do that and somebody might not decide to do that. Ultimately, it's that person's choice of what they choose to do. But if a person comes to me and talks to me about termination of a pregnancy, then I'm going to help them to just understand the natural law of gamma. I'm not going to tell them what they should or shouldn't do because that decision is up to that person to decide for themselves. But I might say, you know, if you terminate the pregnancy, these are the results that you would experience. And if you don't terminate the pregnancy, here's the results that you would experience through the natural law of gamma. And the way that an individual can look at this is look at living compassionately for the welfare of all living beings. And in one situation, somebody might decide to terminate a pregnancy and that's the right answer for them. In another situation, they might decide to not terminate a pregnancy and that might be the right decision for them. So if a woman has a fetus in her womb and we know that this fetus is not going to live a viable life, that it's either already dead or it will die as soon as it comes out through medical technology, we can know this. And if it's threatening the health of the woman, 
it might not be living compassionately for the welfare of all living beings to allow that fetus to continue to grow in the womb. It might be wise to terminate the pregnancy. So the Buddha is not teaching you to preserve all life at all costs. That's not what he's teaching you. He's teaching you to live compassionately for the welfare of all living beings. And in order to have loving kindness and compassion for living beings, you need to have it for yourself. And if you don't have loving kindness and compassion for yourself, you're not going to be able to practice that for others. So as I mentioned, in some situations, it might be wise to terminate the pregnancy. In other situations, it may not be. But ultimately, that decision is up to the people involved. A Buddhist teacher is just here to help you see the cause and effect of what's going to be occurring. And then you make the decision that's right for you. Let's use another example. Like, let's just say I have termites that are eating my home. And now these termites are eating the home and I need to eradicate these termites or else, you know, this shelter is going to fall apart. We're not going to be able to maintain this shelter. So living compassionately for the welfare of all living beings, I might get on the internet and I might start searching, how can I eliminate these beings without actually killing them? And what I might come back with is, There really isn't a way to eliminate these beings without killing them. So I need to live compassionately for the welfare of all living beings. If I let these termites continue to eat our house, my wife, my son, and me, we're going to be out of a shelter. We're not going to be able to live. But if I kill them, then you're killing a living being. But this is the harm that's coming to those beings as a result of them choosing to cause harm. That's the one of the challenges of living in the animal realm is they don't have a higher consciousness to realize, let me go eat these trees in the forest and that would be a wise decision. That if I eat these people's home, then harm's gonna come to me because I'm causing harm. So this is those animals' gamma. This is the result of their decisions. So you're gonna need to look at this precept in any particular situation that you're in, and you're gonna need to weigh the options of what's wise for you to do in any given situation. Let's take another example, like let's say war. So a government can say to you, hey, Those people over there in that country, we would like you to go over there and kill them. And if you go over there and kill those people, we're not going to prosecute you for murder. But if you come home and you murder someone in our country, we're going to prosecute you for murder. This is a human law. The human laws, they're not functioning based on the natural law of gamma because they're created and administered and enforced by humans. And humans are going to have this error in our way of doing things. We're going to make certain mistakes. But this natural law of gamma, it's a natural law that's functioning at all times. And it's not being administered by any one particular person. So My government could tell me like, okay, you can go over there and kill those people. We're not going to prosecute you for murder, but I can't escape the results of my decisions. Any decisions that you make, you're going to experience the results. This is why if you go off to war, you're very likely to be killed yourself or get injured or come back with some kind of mental challenges. You might commit suicide. You might get amputations or things like this. You can have all kinds of difficulties when you go off to war. So when we're talking about the natural law of gamma, we're not talking about just the laws of society or or governmental laws. We're talking about the natural laws of existence. We're talking about this cause and effect or action and result. And it's not always black and white. It's not that you should never kill, but it's not that you should always kill either. So you're going to need to look at each individual situation with your clarity of mind and decide what would be the wise decision here. And in some cases, students come and talk with teachers and they say, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. What are your thoughts? And I'll share with you my guidance and my advice, but I'll never tell you what to do. I'll say, well, if you do it this way, here's what you'll generally experience. If you do it this way, here's generally what you'll experience, but decision is yours. And no matter what you decide, I'm still here to support you and still here to encourage you. I don't want you to do anything specific. So if somebody came to me and say, Hey, I'm interested in terminating this pregnancy. I thought I'd get your advice. Okay. Here's the natural law of gamma. Here's what you can consider. And if they choose to terminate a pregnancy or they choose not to terminate it, I'm still here to support them, encourage them and help them because I don't want them to do anything specific because each individual needs to decide for themselves what's best for their life. And each individual person is the only one who knows all the variables in their life. A teacher, no matter how much we know about the natural law of gamma, I can't know all the individual variables that you're confronting in any one given decision. So we're here to provide you guidance and advice on this natural law. And in this particular one, you can see where, yeah, there's a pretty large gray area. And you're gonna see with some of the other ones, it's that way as well. But the more you learn it, the more you practice 
practice it, you'll be able to apply it and be able to see more and more clarity of how to apply it in a given situation. So for example, like this, do not resuscitate. This is a DNR. I don't know if your country has this or if you know what this is about. What this is, is that you can go to a lawyer and you can fill out a contract where you're essentially leaving a legal agreement with your relatives that says, if you die, that don't bring you back to life. Don't use medical technology to bring you back to life. This is still practicing this precept because you haven't done any intentional killing. What you're saying is you're comfortable with death. And if this body dies, don't use medical technology to bring you back to life. So sometimes students ask me, you know, if I put a DNR in place, am I still practicing this precept? Yeah, you're still practicing. You haven't killed anybody. You haven't taken the life of any living being. You're just choosing that if this being dies, you're okay with that. Don't use any medical technology to bring me back to life. Then you might look at something like defense and protection. Like say you're in your house 2 a.m. in the morning, sleeping, and somebody breaks into your house. They break in through a window. I guarantee you they're not bringing you chocolate and flowers. I'm almost sure of it. They're not bringing you chocolate and flowers 2 a.m. in the morning, breaking into your house. They're there to do you harm. And what I would advise somebody to do in that situation is if you can, get out of the house. Call the police somewhere else. They're the ones who have the tools, the training, the ability to come in and deal with that issue. But you might find yourself backed up against a wall, maybe you and or your family. And if this person is trying to do harm to you, what I would say to you is you might need to cause harm back in order to stop this situation. If you're going to have compassion for all living beings, which compassion is concern for the misfortune of others. If you're going to have compassion for beings, you have to have compassion for this being first. So if you just sat there and and let this person beat you up or stab you or hit you with a baseball bat or whatever it is that they're trying to do, you're not having compassion for this being who you are. So if you need to cause harm in order to stop that harm that's coming to you, then you're going to need to do that. But what I would encourage you to do is cause the least amount of harm as possible. Whereas if you can just hold them and tie them up, or if they have a baseball bat, if you can get a bigger baseball bat, um, whatever you need to do, cause the least amount of harm as possible. But ultimately, if you needed to take the life of this person, there's no harm that's going to come to you because of the natural law of gamma. This person was causing you harm. And if you had to kill that person, No harm is going to come to you as a result of that. But that's where you'd like to make sure that you're causing the least amount of harm as possible, right? If you're able to just get, you know, a stick or a baseball bat or something like that, that's ideal. If you don't have to kill this person, that would be ideal. But if you had to, you're not going to experience any unwholesome results because of the natural law of gamma. So in some cases, you might need to defend or protect this being who you are. Because remember, the Buddha is not teaching to preserve all life at all costs. He's saying to live compassionately for the welfare of all living beings. So by causing the least amount of harm as possible, that's living compassionately for all living beings. Then you might think about consuming animal products. If right now you're eating meat, which plenty of people do eat meat, you might decide to move over to a plant-based food supply. This isn't something that anyone's going to force you to do or convince you to do or tell you that you have to do. It's your life, it's your decisions, and it's your results. What you might see if you start investigating this is that by eating animal flesh, you're ingesting not only the flesh of the animal, and that animal has to be killed in order for that to occur, but you're also ingesting drugs, hormones, and toxins, and things like this. Even if you eat wild salmon, they've taken wild salmon out of very clean rivers in America, and they tested the flesh, and they found all kinds of substances, like cocaine, antidepressants, all kinds of things. There was like 90 some different substances in the flesh of this fish. And when you eat that, you're eating those same things. And when you eat farmed animals, any kind of hormones or antibiotics or anything like this that go into those farmed animals, you're also ingesting that. So when you eat meat, you might find that you have issues in your digestion. You might find certain sickness in the body. And when you eliminate the meat from your food supply, move to a plant-based food supply, you'll see more health in the body. 
And that's the results of your decisions. You also see improvement to the condition of the mind because if you're ingesting animal flesh, as I mentioned, you're ingesting drugs, hormones, and toxins. So those things are all affecting your mind. You'll notice more clarity in your mind. So when or if you ever decide to move to a plant-based food supply, it's your choice. It's your life. It's your decisions. But as you do, remember the teachings of the Buddha are independently verifiable. You can see the truth for yourself that you get less sick and that you experience more clarity in your mind. But when or if you ever choose to do that, it's your choice. And if you do decide to move to a plant-based food supply, I would suggest you do it slowly, gradually, that you gradually phase meat out because the mind craving permanence and it doesn't like impermanence, if you do things abruptly, the body and the mind is going to probably revolt. It's not going to like this. It's going to be very challenging for you. But if you gradually move away from meat and gradually bring more and more plants into your food supply, eventually you can get to the point where the body and the mind is transitioned and it's completely comfortable with this new food supply. So that's something you might decide to look at on your own terms. If you ever would like advice or guidance, I will help you. I transitioned over to a plant-based food supply and it took time and there's more details in this book around all of these topics that you might decide to read and investigate and get clarification on. So is there any questions you guys have on this first precept? Yes, ma'am. We still do have people online, so thank you for using the microphones. Just a clarificatory question. So just to pick one of these examples where yeah. I have experience, which is euthanasia of an animal. Um, I love animals, and I've seen that this can be a very, probably, the best way to go. So I just want to uh, check. So would that mean when I um, allow an animal to be euthanized under conditions where they're suffering and it will reduce their suffering compared to a situation where I let the animal die naturally. How does that influence my karma? Again, I think I might have missed that. Sure. So I didn't talk about each one of these individually. So you're welcome to ask any questions that you like. So if you choose to kill a animal or through euthanasia, we call it euthanasia because it sounds better in a medical context. But what we're really doing is we're killing that being. We're taking its life based on our choice and our decision. And oftentimes somebody's doing this when it's a pet because they're experiencing painful feelings to see the pet sick. And they know that this animal is going to die. It has cancer, it has leukemia or what have you. And when an individual is experiencing those painful feelings, the mind thinks that if I euthanize this animal, if I kill this animal, that that's going to solve the problem. But it actually isn't solving the problem because what the real problem is, is inside the person's mind, having craving and wanting this animal to be permanently healthy when this isn't possible, it's just impermanence. The other problem that is actually being experienced is this animal is stuck in the cycle of rebirth. That's the real problem that is being experienced because now that this being is in existence, it's going to need to get to an improved existence like a human realm or a heavenly realm in order to experience enlightenment and escape this whole cycle of rebirth. So that's the real problem that this animal is experiencing. It's not the cancer, it's not the leukemia or whatever other problems that it might have. That's not the real problem. That's just impermanence. The real problem that it's having is it's stuck in the cycle of rebirth and it needs to get out. So if we kill an animal, say, you know, six years old because it has cancer. That means that it didn't get to live out its full gamma, its full results of its decisions. So say it would have lived till six and a half or seven or eight years old, it would have experienced more of its gamma and it would have an improved rebirth in its next birth, potentially getting closer and closer to the human realm or heavenly realm to then be able to escape the cycle of rebirth. If we euthanize it, then it's not getting that opportunity to fully live out its gamma. And this is where when you make a decision to euthanize, someone can feel guilty or someone can feel shameful. That discontentedness that the mind experiences, that is the gamma. Then if an individual repeatedly kills like this or repeatedly does these kinds of things, then what they can experience is a shortened lifespan themselves. This is why like if somebody goes off to war and they kill, they can die right at 18, 20, 25 years old because they're repeatedly killing. If you look at like a serial murderer, they can 
be killing a lot of people and then they go to jail and then somebody kills them, right? So when you kill and you repeatedly kill, the gamma that you experience is that you're very likely to get killed yourself and die. And at a very minimum, you can experience guilt or shame or these other kinds of things related to your choice to kill another animal or kill another living being. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I can see where part of that comes from, but I mean, in, for example, in this particular example, um, I don't feel guilt or shame or anything, quite the opposite. I had mm -hmm. situations where an animal uh, died without this interference, and mm -hmm. it was way more painful, much more suffering, and mm -hmm. I regretted that. I felt like shame about that. So, I mean, we're not talking about a case where mm -hmm. some uh, an animal could live for another uh, six months, but I mean, like... To, one example, like I had a cat and it was towards the end of her life, she wasn't able to pee or anything anymore. She would have internally just like be um, poisoned and die in a very horrible way. So it was a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering how much like the compassion part comes in there as well. So, you mm -hmm. know, to decide on it, you know, causing the least suffering for that animal. But I understand mm -hmm. that or maybe I don't quite understand how the idea that the animal can live out uh, their full karma comes in. Yeah, this is really challenging for people to understand is you're not solving the problem by euthanizing the animal. The animal is experiencing impermanence. That's all that's happening. An individual, when they're choosing to euthanize an animal, it's not a compassionate killing. This is what some people label it as, is a compassionate killing. You can't kill someone compassionately. It's not possible. Um, as, as long as you're making the choice that I would like to kill this being because I think this being is suffering and that's better for that being, you're making the choice for that being. You're making the choice to kill. And that's very unwise for an individual to put themselves in a position that they're choosing to kill another being. And it's going to produce unwholesome results for you. It's producing unwholesome results for that being, but it's very challenging for the mind to be able to see this as the case. If um, you experience those same things that the cat was experiencing, would you like to die? You would. Okay. So that's a crave that, so that's a craving for non-existence. You see, see how you were doing that? That's your craving. So that's the longing. That's the yearning. You would like to get to the point where you don't have that craving. You don't have that longing and yearning. And that's how you can get to peace. Because right now, if you experience that particular thing, you would be experiencing painful feelings in the mind because you're having craving to be permanently healthy. And now when you're experiencing this lack of health, your mind is experiencing sadness or anger or misery or despair, but that's not being caused by the sickness. That's not being caused by the illness. It's being caused by the craving in the mind. So as long as you allow this craving to persist, then you're going to keep experiencing continuous rebirth. That's the real problem that you're experiencing. This pain that the body is going through, the physical pain, and then thus the mental pain, that is a problem. But the real bigger problem that one is experiencing on this particular topic is the cycle of rebirth. And you can't escape out of that if you keep heaving to the craving. I'm craving for my cat to be permanently healthy. And when it's unhealthy, I don't like that. So therefore, I'm going to kill it so that it doesn't have to be unhealthy anymore. This is what the mind does in the unenlightened state. It thinks that if I kill this, it's going to solve this problem. But it's not actually solving the problem of the discontentedness, and it's not solving the problem of the cycle of rebirth either. And you may not see that right now in our conversation, but if you think about it more, if you reflect on it more, if you train your mind more with loving kindness meditation and developing more compassion in the mind, you'll be able to come to this understanding more and more uh, readily. Like there was times in my life that I thought that euthanasia and these kinds of things were wise decisions too. But when you spend time reflecting on it and you thinking about it over time, you might come to a different thought or different perspective and it might not be today. So how does an animal get from the animal realm to the human realm, which as far as I understand is the best, um, realm to reach enlightenment. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. These natural laws of existence, 
they're affecting all of us, whether we're aware of them or not. So, for example, like a lion, a lion is killing, a snake is killing and killing and killing. It's very challenging to go from like a lion straight into human existence because there's so much killing that that being is doing. The natural laws of existence are affecting it. it has a lot of craving in the mind. So it's very challenging to go from those types of existences into a human existence. But an animal like a elephant, for example, an elephant tends to be more compassionate. It doesn't kill to eat. It eats plants. So in the animal realm, you have to experience continuous rebirth countless times within the animal realm until you eventually get to an animal that has improved decision making and improved gamma. And now that being like an elephant is more likely to be reborn into the human realm than that snake or that tiger. But eventually those snakes and tigers will get to like a turtle or a rabbit or something like this that isn't killing, that doesn't have aggression and hostility the way that a lion or a tiger does. They need to burn off that craving, that anger, that ignorance. And so you can cultivate your mind to a certain degree in the animal realm, but just not enough to enlightenment. So as they cultivate their mind, becoming more compassionate, more loving, making wiser decisions, they can eventually get into the human realm. And it's the same natural laws that's affecting them, that's affecting us. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, as I understand, so karma is um, following the soul in a way or, or something. No? No. The Buddha never taught that there is a soul mm. or there isn't a soul. He left it as an undeclared teaching. So he talks at different times. Of course, he has all these teachings, but there's a particular discourse where he says, you know, these are my teachings. This is what I declared. And then he says, remember what I did not declare. I did not declare these teachings. So he declared his undeclared teaching. So he didn't say whether there is a soul mm-hmm. or there isn't a soul, but I think your question is going to be, how does your gamma go from one life to yeah, the I next? Mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'll explain that to you. So let's just say like you have being a, And then you have being B. So you have person A and you have person B, right? Now, person B has certain cravings, anger, and ignorance in their mind. And they're going all through their life and they get to the end of their life. And now because they have craving in their mind, craving is the fuel that causes rebirth. If you have craving at the time of death, there will be rebirth. That's like a spark on a fire. If you have a fire that has logs on it and it's sending off sparks into the air, then these sparks are going to get carried by the wind and now it's going to land and it's going to ignite a new fire. Because this fire has fuel, it's going to send off sparks and there's going to be a new fire. The same thing is if your mind has fuel, which is craving, desire, attachment, that fuel is sending off sparks and now it's going to create a new consciousness or a new mind. So at the end of person A's life, if they have craving in their mind, it's going to produce, that's the cause and condition that's going to produce the new consciousness. And there's going to be a brand new mind. But this brand new mind, it's going to have the cravings and residual memories from person A are now in person B. And now person B is making decisions in their new life based on cravings from their previous life. So let's just say person A is Bob. And let's just say Bob all throughout his life, he had all kinds of sexual craving and he had all kinds of different relationships with different people, having lots and lots and lots and lots of sex. And now he gets to the end of his life. He still is craving in his mind. He dies. And now it spawns this new consciousness. And now let's just say it's Barbara. And now this new being is Barbara. It's the same cravings and residual memories from Bob, but it's a brand new consciousness. It's a brand new body. And now Barbara starts having sex with lots of different people, going outside relationships and different things like this. And now let's say Barbara contracts HIV and maybe she passes away and dies. And then now maybe she goes back in and now this consciousness spawns a new consciousness and now it gets born into the animal realm at that point, right? Well, the gamma that Barbara is experiencing, it's based on her decisions, but it's from cravings from her previous life when she was Bob. So that's how you experience your gamma from one life to the next. It's not this dark cloud or anything following you around. It's not like a soul or anything like that. It's the mind is like a container. It's like cardboard box A and cardboard box B. Each cardboard box, it's a different size, different shape, different color, different texture. But the contents of cardboard box A, when that cardboard box dissolves, 
the contents of craving and residual memories go into this new cardboard box. And now that's Barbara. And now Barbara's going to be making decisions based on those contents. That's how you experience okay. gamma so, from your previous life. So like a child then that haven't started making any decisions. A what? A child mm -hmm. that haven't started making decisions. And mm -hmm. they acquire uh, cancer early or get abused or even die. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So this is, were you done? Okay, so this is also the gamma. This is the results of the decisions, right? It's not punishment and rewards. It's a sequencing of events that say that in this old life, you had certain cravings and residual memories. Craving is what determines whether you experience rebirth or not. But your gamma, the results of your decisions, determines what realm you're born into and what condition you are within that realm. So if somebody is born into a body that at the age of 10 gets cancer and they die. This is old gamma from their previous life that based on what they were doing in that life, their mind ended up in this new, new body. And this body is old gamma from their previous life. So the condition of them in that life is based on their previous life. Yeah. That sounds like the soul though. Like there's some personal karma coming through many lifetimes then. It would I mean, be even though it would be unwise soul, to but yeah. yeah it would be unwise to think that way because okay. that's not a declared teaching and the soul conflicts with the universal truth of impermanence and it mm. conflicts with the universal truth of non-self mm. so the Buddha wisely didn't declare whether there is a soul or there isn't a soul he just left it as Some an undeclared type of metaphysic, teaching. Yeah. Seems like it just, so mm. what's moving from one life to the next even though we call it the cycle of rebirth there's nothing that's being reborn. So the word that was in the original teachings of the Buddha, it's called samsara. This is the original word. But people are translating it as the cycle of rebirth, which in my opinion is unwise because if you see the way that the Buddha describes it, he describes it as what I would describe as the cycle of new existence. Each existence is completely new. It's a new body and it's a new mind every single time. The only thing that's moving from one life to the next is your cravings and your residual memories. That's the only thing that's moving from one life to the next. So while many people think of it and describe it as the cycle of rebirth, I would encourage you to think of it as the cycle of new existence. This is going to bring you to a better understanding so you can see that this concept of a soul doesn't fit in with what the Buddha is teaching about how the world functions. And it's an undeclared teaching. So if you think of it as the cycle of new existence, even though you might hear it described as the cycle of rebirth, that's a better way for you to understand what's truly happening in that experience. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You guys are being so friendly to each other, passing the mics around. Yeah helping each other. I saw you guys sharing mats with the new students who were coming. That was very nice of you guys to share mats and that kind of thing. That was wonderful. So I'm just curious, is it possible in this lifetime to resolve a previous karma? Yes. And that's what you're doing on the path to enlightenment is you're working to extinguish all your unwholesome karma. And that's why getting to wise decision making mm -hmm. with things like the five precepts is so important because as long as you have unwise decisions and you haven't experienced the unwholesome results, there is going to be rebirth. So when I talk tomorrow about the natural law of karma, I'm going to explain to you wholesome karma and unwholesome karma old gamma and new gamma, and then I'm going to teach you how to extinguish your unwholesome gamma because that's what you're doing on the path to enlightenment is you're extinguishing all your unwholesome gamma. So by the time you get to enlightenment, you're only experiencing wholesome gamma. That's it. You only have wholesome gamma. That's it. You're not experiencing anything unwholesome anymore. That's one of the reasons why your mind is so peaceful and joyful. And one of the reasons why your life is so peaceful and so joyful. Everything's at ease because you're not making any unwise decisions that produces unwholesome results. Everything's wholesome. So yeah, you're extinguishing. That's what you're doing through the Eightfold Path is extinguishing your unwholesome gamma by making only wise decisions. But we'll get to that tomorrow. And this is leading you up to that because you need to know how to make wise decisions through the five precepts. Microphone check, one, two. <laughs> oh, I've always wanted to do that. You're going to do some beatboxing for us? I'm actually totally confused with this and it's probably going to be a silly question in a way. But if I'm right in saying the, the rebirth or the 
existence is your mind going into another body. Mm -hmm. How then do we end up looking like our parents and have personality traits like our parents if we're just a mind from someone else? It's a new mind in a new body every time. So it's not a mind from someone else. It's a brand new mind. So if at the time of death, if Mary still has craving at the time of death, then this body is impermanent and this mind is impermanent. But because there's craving in the mind, that's the fuel, that spark. It's going to lead to the creation of a new consciousness. And now that new consciousness is going to find a body. This body is based on an egg from your mom and a sperm from your dad. And now you've got those genetics. This body is old gamma. It's coming from your mom and dad. And you look like perhaps your mom or dad. That's because of the genetics involved. But this mind found that body based on your gamma, based on the results of your decisions. from your previous life. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah that's what it's, I'm... Yeah, there's but, no you, exactly. I, yeah, but then it's I've got... from the being's previous life. Yeah, I'm probably getting confused then with like the personality traits or I'm very similar to my mum in a lot of things that I do and my dad, yeah, is it conditioning okay. or... Uh, it, so it's, what that is, is that's conditioning of the mind yeah, from right. you being around your yeah, mom just, and yeah. seeing her habits mm. and her traits and the way she does things. Mm you've picked that up and followed what she does. Mm. Because if you were taken away from your mom and sent somewhere else at birth, you wouldn't have that same personality traits. You develop that from observing your mom and having that conditioning. Yeah, I mean, some people do argue that as well, though, don't you? I was a foster carer for many years, and uh, I've had children that have been taken away from the parents, but then when they've actually met them in you know, years Yeah, so in my opinion, this is people just looking for those things, right? Okay. right? It's yeah. not actually like, uh, it's not that they picked it up from that person or it's not that in, innately their mind just started functioning that way. It's that they really want that child it's to it's be like able to see it. Like, yeah, yeah, it's like a placebo effect, right? Yeah. yeah. There's nothing genetic about personality or characteristics. There's nothing genetic. That's what people, that's what people say, but it's not because everything about your personality is based in your mind. I'll share it this way. This is how you can see the truth on this. Okay. So let's just say like in my case, my mom, when I grew up, she was very bitter, harsh, hostile, you know, this kind of thing. Right. And that's the way she was. The reason why she was like that is because of craving, anger, and ignorance. Okay, so now I grew up that way, and that's the way I was for a long time. But then when you train your mind and you eliminate craving, anger, and ignorance, you're not going to be that way anymore. You're not going to be bitter, harsh, and hostile. So even though I grew up that way, and I was like that way for a period of time, once you purify your mind, if you become enlightened, you're not going to have any of the personality traits of your unenlightened mom, right? So if this was genetic, in your personality and your characteristics were genetic. That means if your mom, in my case, was angry, bitter, hostile, and harsh, I would always be bitter, angry, hostile, and harsh, right? I think even if it's genetic, I mean, we all naturally have a tendency, for example, to crave things. So everyone mm -hmm. would have that. No, not everyone. Right. Only unenlightened beings have that. No, yeah, yeah, but like, mm -hmm. we're kind of born in this way. Mm -hmm. If, if personality was genetic, then that means it would stay with you all the way through your entire life. That if my mom was bitter and harsh and hostile and that's her personality, then that means, okay, that's genetic. And now I can only ever be bitter, harsh and hostile. I would be stuck with that because it's in my genetics. It's in my genes and I can't change it. 
So you can see this true reality if you look at it closely. Don't hold on to what you currently believe, but if you look at it closely, you can see that personality and characteristics, they're not genetic. It's all based on what's going on in your mind. Your mind is impermanent and you can purify that and you can get to the peace and joy, which has nothing to do with this parent who's maybe bitter and harsh and hostile. If you believed that your personality was genetic, then that means you can't do anything to change it. It's permanent. But do we see anything permanent in the world around us? Is there anything permanent around the world that you see? Universal truth of impermanence. So if you believe that it's genetics, then you can't do anything to change it. And Genetics are impermanent as well, but your personality and your characteristics in the mind, that's not coming from your genetics. That's coming from what's going on in your mind in terms of these pollutions. Your behavior, your conduct, the way you interact in the world, that's based on your either pollutions of mind, your unwholesome qualities, or your wholesome qualities that are in the mind. That's where your conduct, whether you're skillful or unskillful, or whether you're practicing moral conduct or you're immoral, that's all based on the pollution in your mind. Mm-hmm. Not sure why these mics aren't working so well. <laughs> there you go. You got, I think you guys aren't patient enough. It takes yes. about a okay. second to Hello? kick in. Yeah, okay. okay, I have one question. Um, during the course, um, we've been able to find evidence or to prove the truth of the teaching of the Buddha based on, of, on our own experiences mm-hmm. and observations. Mm-hmm of the world around us, Mm -hmm. but when it comes to the cycle of rebirth Mm -hmm. uh, and the, you know, as a result of unwholesome karma, Mm -hmm. how can we find, how can we prove the truth of that? Or is it a matter of faith or so-called faith? No, you don't ever believe even the cycle of rebirth. I have something that students ask this question all the time. So I have something that I wrote up to show you how to independently verify the cycle of rebirth. There's 15 things that I share that says, this is how I independently verified it. And this is how you can independently verify it too. So if you'd like to do that, you can send me a message and I'll send it back to you. I suggest for people to approach the cycle of rebirth after they've already learned the core central teachings, because one of the best ways to verify the cycle of rebirth, even though there's other ways, is for you to observe your past lives. If you observe your existences in your past, you will undoubtedly know that the cycle of rebirth is true. And when your mind's polluted, you oftentimes don't have the ability to remember things from your past life. But if you focus on the core central teaching and you're eliminating the pollution out of your mind, this is where your mind will potentially start observing your past lives. But there's other things that you can see if you ask me, like I can share with you, like, have you ever had deja vu? Do you know what that is? Deja vu? Yep. These are your residual memories from your past lives coming up, right? Because it's something that you're doing now and you're like, oh my goodness, I've done this before, but you know it wasn't in this life. This is your residual memories bubbling up. Even without being on the path to enlightenment, people can have deja vu. But there's these 15 things that I share, and I documented it so that people can learn it. But if you'd like that information, you're welcome to ask me. I'll send it to you. I usually suggest for people to set it to the side because what's happened in the past, it's in the past. It's long in the past. It doesn't matter now. What may or may not happen in the future, it's in the future. It hasn't happened yet. Right now, you're in the present moment. You're a human being. Your mind's discontent. You would like to experience this peace and joy. Focus on getting to enlightenment in this life, learning the core central teachings. Then a year, year and a half, two years into your development, you've got all the core teachings underway. You'd like to learn the cycle of rebirth and independently verify that. That's a better time to do it. But even then, you're not believing. You're not faith. There's ways to independently verify it in this content that I have, if you would like it, I'll send it to you and it gives you 15 points of how to independently verify it. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, this is a, a bit of an out of the box uh, question, but um, last year in uh, 2022, I mean, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics. Mm-hmm. So they, they proved uh, sort of the double slit uh, experiment and that you can sort of that two particles across the universe act as one in a way. So you can sort of poke one article and the other one is sort of affected across the universe. So wondering if if you have sort of looked into that and I think if that, and that if that can be sort of related to the transition of lives and um, 
metaphysic aspect of this. <laughs> I haven't looked at that. No. <laughs> Seems to be something uh, correlated, at least. From my experience, yeah. science is only proving the Buddhist teachings to be more and more true. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, what it's he taught, to catch, what that, he taught 2,500 years ago. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. every time science comes out with exactly. something, it's like, yeah, the Buddha was already teaching that yeah, 2,500 yeah, yeah. years but ago. That, so that, yeah, there's a lot of articles around that. That, was, that finding is sort of a turning point in, in science to work on yeah. a more metaphysical uh, level. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. The more that you look at science and the more you understand the teachings of the Buddha, you'll just see that they're just proving more and more that his teachings are so accurate, but you can do that work on your own within your own life practice and get to a lot of those conclusions, even without science. All right. This is the first precept. You guys are a lot of questions. Okay. So, I think these next ones. Oh, do we have another question here? Okay. Um, let me just be sure. Okay. So let's go to the second precept and share some more with you guys. This is great that you guys are so comfortable and asking questions and you aren't attached to lunch anymore and any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and that's generosity, sharing, sharing food, right? Okay, so let's go to the second precept. This one, the Buddha is teaching, abandoning the taking of what is not given, living purely, accepting what is given, awaiting what is given without stealing. So here, of course, he's sharing, don't steal, right? We can't cause discontentedness for another person. Nobody can cause you discontentedness. But you can cause people harm. Harm and discontentedness are two different things. Like if I stole somebody's car, I've caused them harm because now they can't go to work and make money. They can't take their kids to school. They can't buy the things that they need by going shopping and stuff like this. I've caused them harm. They worked a certain amount in order to get that car and now I've caused harm to them. But if they're discontent, they're causing that discontentedness themselves because the mind's craving permanence. But if you cause harm, then harm's going to come back to you because you need to practice harmlessness. So the Buddha is teaching you here not to cause harm to others by stealing stuff because you'll experience people are coming after you. People are fighting. People are going to injure you. People might kill you. You might get arrested. These are all harmful things that are going to come to you based on your unwise decision because you made an unwise decision to steal. Now this unwholesome result is going to come back to you. So that's why he's teaching not to steal. But also it's unwise to assume that something can be taken or used. Say that you were in a college class and you're going to turn in an exam paper to your professor and you saw this stapler on their desk. The professor was out of the room and you just grabbed that stapler and you started using the stapler. And now the professor walks into the room and says, Hey, what are you doing? You're using my stapler, right? They're maybe attached to their stapler and now they're getting angry. They're getting frustrated. They don't understand right view. They don't understand craving is what's causing them to be angry. They're going to attribute their painful feelings to you and now they might give you a bad grade on that paper, or they might even fail you in the entire class. So one of the things that the Buddha is teaching you is how to get along and navigate this world with a bunch of people who have craving, anger, and ignorance. He's teaching you how to navigate the world of unenlightened beings. So it would be unwise to assume that something can be used. It's wise to ask questions. Hey, professor, do you think I can use your stapler? Oh, sure. Go ahead. But they also might say, no, you can't use it. Okay, no worries. I'll go find one somewhere else. You go ask someone else, or maybe you go buy one, right? So don't assume that things can be used. Here, the Buddha is talking about accepting what is given. If people are practicing generosity with you, it's wise to accept their generosity because then it helps them to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, and it helps you to build a relationship too. If you were to shut down people's generosity, you'll find that people will be less and less generous with you over time. So like say grandma gives you a sweater at Christmas and you know that you're never going to ever wear that sweater ever. It's wise to just accept that sweater. And now when you get that sweater, grandma got to practice generosity and it helps her mind, right? But now if you know you're not going to wear that sweater, instead of letting it rot away in the closet for 20 or 30 years and nobody gets to use it, 
you can give it to somebody else. Some cultures call this regifting, and they think that it's bad to regift. Well, the other option is to let it sit in the closet for 20 or 30 years. If grandma gets angry because you gave it to somebody else, grandma didn't practice pure generosity. She's causing that anger herself. She had an expectation. She had a craving, a wanting, a longing, a yearning. You didn't cause her anger. So now if you re-gift it, maybe it goes through 10 different hands. All those people get to practice generosity. And then it's going to eventually find someone that says, that's the most beautiful sweater I've ever seen. I'm going to wear it every day. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much. So now you just allowed that to go on. You 10 different people got to practice generosity. So it's wise to accept what is given. But remember, this is not black and white, right? If someone offers you cocaine or heroin, are you going to take it? No, right? You're like, okay, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, I don't accept that, right? So it's not black and white. The Buddha is not giving you rules here. He's showing you how to navigate this world more harmoniously with other beings. So it's wise to accept what's given, but you need that discernment. You need that wise decision making that's in there. Then the other part here, he says, awaiting what is given. What this is, is that you don't put your expectations on people to give you something. So say you have a life partner and they're going on a business trip. If you're like, hey, get me this, get me this, get me this, get me this. Now they're going to adopt your expectations as their own. They're going to be racing around that town trying to find you what you want. And if they can't get it, they're going to be angry and frustrated. Or if they come back and they don't have what you want them to have, you're going to be frustrated and angry. So the Buddha teaches you to await what is given. Don't put your expectations on people of they have to give you something. So this is why like in a Buddhist temple, you won't see people passing a bowl around asking for a donation because we just await what is given. If people would like to practice generosity with us and share to help us pay electric and water and things like this, okay, great, they'll share with us. But we're just going to be sharing. We're just going to be practicing generosity, sharing the teachings, sharing resources and things like this. If someone else chooses to practice generosity with us, so be it. We don't have any expectation that that would occur, but some people choose to practice generosity and some people don't. It's up to them. So if you await what is given and you don't have an expectation, it protects your mind so that you don't end up frustrated. Because if you have an expectation of getting something from somebody and you don't get it, you'll be frustrated. You'll be angry. So any questions on this one? Pretty straightforward, but once again, there's a gray area here that you need to navigate. And if you have the wisdom, you can navigate that, right? Okay. So let's go to the next one. The next one is about sexual misconduct. This is the Buddha describing sexual misconduct. He says, abandoning unchastity, abandoning sexual relations with women, men who are protected by their mother, father, mother, and father, brother, sister, or relatives who are protected by teachings who have husband, wife, or partner whose violation entails a penalty or even with one who has been garlanded by a man, woman, or partner as a sign of engagement. Okay, so this is quite long and quite detailed where he's explaining harmful sexual conduct where if you cause harm, this harm comes back to you. So one of the things you might notice where he says abandoning sexual relations with people who are protected by their mother, father, mother, father, brother, sister, or relatives. What he's talking about here is minors. If there's a minor who's 12 years old and you're choosing to have sex with them, it's very impactful to them. They're being guided by their parents. They're learning. They're growing. If you choose to have sex with a minor, it's going to kind of pull them out of that development process. So it's wise to have sex with people who are of age and who are not protected by their mother, father, brothers, and sisters. That's what the Buddha is sharing here. And in most cases, the human laws are the same, but there are some places in the world that it's legal to have sex with minors based on the government. But if you look at those cultures, they're really struggling in those cultures where they're doing that because the children aren't growing up and developing their mind and learning from their parents. This is the gamma of those cultures, right? So the gamma, you can't escape that. Then notice here where he says, whose violation entails a penalty. That's having sex without consent. That would be like raping somebody, having sex against their consent. Then notice where he says abandoning unchastity. Chastity would be having no sex at all. If you guys know what a chastity belt is, in the old days, 
fathers would put like a metal belt around their daughter and it would have a key, a lock and a key. And it was only the father that had the key and nobody else could get into these underwear if the father didn't use the key. Imagine it was pretty uncomfortable to walk around with metal underwear, but this is what they would do. It's called chastity where you're not having sex with anybody at all unchastity would be having sex with lots of different people, lots of different people. So if you had sex with lots and lots and lots of different people, like multiple partners at the same time, that would be unwise. And that's why you get sexually transmitted diseases if you've ever done those kinds of things. So if you just have one partner at a time and then be loyal and loving and committed in that relationship, that's going to produce the best results for you. So that's the wise decision is to have sex with just one partner at a time. When that relationship's over, you end that relationship and move on. Not only do people get sexually transmitted diseases when they have sex with multiple partners like that, but people get beat up, they get murdered, People have been murdered for this kind of stuff, right? Someone finds out that you're cheating on them. They get really angry because they're attached. And now someone gets beat up and murdered. I'm not saying that's wise to murder somebody, but that is the result of the decisions that one can experience. Sexually transmitted diseases, getting beat up and injured and murdered and things like that. Here, I put this one in here that in some cultures, they actually will meet a partner they will decide to have a relation with that partner. Then they will go home and they will talk to their parents and say, hey, can my partner move in? We would like to have a relationship together, save money, and then we're gonna move out and get our own house. And in this situation, the parents have accepted the relationship. So that would still be practicing this precept that your parents have approved of you to have this relationship and they know that sex is part of that. So in those types of situations, you're still practicing this precept because the family has accepted the relationship. Hear this part where it says, who are protected by the teachings. What the Buddha is describing there is there are some people who have decided to remain celibate and no longer have sex at all. The ordained practitioners are that way. Typically, people who are wearing white are not having sex either. And this is a way for other people to know that that person isn't having sex. Whereas if you were trying to lure that person away from their celibacy, this is causing that person harm and it's causing the wider community harm as well. Because in order to get to enlightenment, ultimately an individual will need to eliminate sex. When or if you ever decide to do that is up to you. You can actually get to the second stage of enlightenment and still have a sexual relationship. And you and your partner might be having a sexual relationship and you might be having a great time and that's very fulfilling for you. Fine. But at some point, if you would like to get to enlightenment, you're going to need to let go of sex. And the reason why is because the mind with craving for sexual contact, in some cases you're going to get it and you're going to feel all that pleasure, but in some cases you can't get it and you're going to be agitated, you're going to be annoyed, you're going to be frustrated. So you can do all the other work on the path to enlightenment and still be maintaining a sexual relationship and your life is going to be very, very peaceful in that second stage of enlightenment. But every once in a while when you want sex and you can't get it, you're going to be agitated and annoyed. So if you ever are interested in getting to complete enlightenment, You might gradually decide, okay, me and my partner, we've been there, done that, you know, enough times. How many more ways can we do that, that different way? And we're going to let go of the sex. But if you're young and you're learning these teachings and you're still having a sexual relationship, you might do all the other work, get to that second stage of enlightenment, hang out there for a period of time, however many years you like. And then when, or if you would ever like to eliminate sexual contact, you can decide to do that. But it's your choice. It's nobody else's choice. It's your own independent journey. You might even have sex all the way to the end of your life. That might be a choice that you decide to do. So each individual decides for themselves. But if somebody's decided that they're no longer going to have sex and you try to lure them away from that, it's harming them because of course it's their decision. But if you're luring them away, then they're not able to continue the progress to get to enlightenment. So the Buddha teaches you not to try to lure people away from their celibacy if that's what they've chosen to do. And here in Thailand, people make it easy because they wear orange robes or they wear white to let people know that. That's not the reason why I chose to wear white. I don't have sex anymore, but just so you guys know that that's not the reason why I wear white to let people know that I'm not having sex. I wear white for other reasons, but that's one of the reasons why people wear white in Thailand is to let people know like I'm no longer having sex. So that's what this part of this precept is where it says who are protected by teachings. And then sex with people who are already committed in relationships, that's where the Buddha says, who have a husband, wife, or partner, 
or even with one who is garlanded by a man, woman, or partner as a sign of engagement. If you were to have sex with people who are in other relationships, again, you can get sexually transmitted diseases, you can get beat up, you can get murdered, all kinds of difficulties. You can lose your reputation in the, in the community by doing those kinds of things. So it would be wise to be sure whoever you're having sex with that they're in a loyal, loving, consenting relationship with you. And then the other part of that is that if you're in a loyal, loving, consenting relationship and you choose to have sex outside of that relationship, that would be unwise too, based on what the Buddha is describing to you here. And then the very bottom one there that I can't, don't think you guys can see here at the temple is it says sex with people who are human trafficked. If someone's human trafficked, they're having sex with multiple, multiple people. And in those environments, again, you can get sexually transmitted diseases. You can get beat up. You can get murdered. You can get robbed. People might rob you in those experiences. So that's why it would be unwise to do those kinds of things. And now some more things here is paid sexual services. This is like going to a sex worker. This person is also having multiple partners as well. And again, you can get sexually transmitted diseases. You can get beat up. You can get murdered. You can get robbed. All of those are unwholesome results that are coming to you from your unwise decisions. Notice that the Buddha doesn't say anything about same gender partners here, or same sex partners. That's because there's no harm that's being caused. If there's a man and a woman that are choosing to have sex with each other, and they're in a loyal, loving, consenting relationship, they're not causing harm to anybody. They're just in a loyal, loving, consenting relationship having sex. Same thing is true about two men or two women. They're in a loyal, loving, consenting relationship. They're not causing harm to anybody at all. So that's why the Buddha doesn't include it here. And if you understand the universal truth of impermanence, then you understand that it's not possible for every man to be interested in having sex with a woman or every woman to be interested in having sex with a man. It's just not possible. So here the Buddha is not including same gender relationships as part of sexual misconduct because there's no harm. There's no harm in that. And he understood this 2,500 years ago. This is how wise that he was. Then you can see transgender individuals that the Buddha is not describing anything about that here. And he was aware of this as he was teaching because he talks about it in his teachings. He talks about men who don't identify with masculine qualities and females who don't identify with feminine qualities, but he doesn't teach anything about it. He just makes the observation that this is happening during his time frame. If you understand transgender individuals, this is the mind is identifying with one gender and the body has a different gender. The sexual organs are of different gender. So if you understand the universal truth of impermanence, then you understand that it's not possible for every mind to identify with exactly the same qualities or the same gender that is in the body. So you can have the mind that is of one gender and the body's sexual organs can be a completely different gender because the universal truth of impermanence tells you that not every mind is going to be the same gender as the physical body. So this is completely normal that transgender individuals exist. And if you understand the cycle of rebirth, that we've all been different beings in the past, this helps you to understand transgender individuals too, that even though you're a female or a male right now, maybe you identify with the mind being that way or the body identifying that way. In the past, you were a male or a female or different gender. So an individual can have a mind that identifies as one gender and the body has a different sexual organs. And this can be because of the universal truth of impermanence. We understand it that way. And you can understand it through the cycle of rebirth that we've all been different genders. So the mind can end up in this life with a mind that is of one gender and the body is a different gender. And this is completely normal. They're not doing anything wrong. The individual hasn't harmed anybody. This is their body. This is their mind. And we don't need to have any judgment or opinion or look down on that because it's all completely normal. Other people might have a craving for everybody to identify with the same gender as their body. And then they get angry when they see somebody who's transgender. And this is coming from their ignorance, their unknowing of true reality. But if you have the wisdom of the natural laws of existence, the universal truth of impermanence and the cycle of rebirth, you can eliminate any craving for everybody to be with an opposite gender, a couple or everybody to identify with the same gender as their body. So you can eliminate your craving if you have a craving and then you won't be angry or frustrated or irritated if you see a transgender person or someone who's in a same gender relationship. 
it's completely normal. And this is the reason why here in Thailand, you see it pretty commonly out and about because people aren't judging that. They understand that, hey, it's completely normal to men, to women, transgender individuals. It's all completely normal. So now let's talk a little bit about masturbation as it relates to this. Masturbation, there isn't any harm that's being caused to another person. You're not causing harm to other people through masturbation, right? You're doing something with yourself. There's only one being involved. But masturbation isn't necessarily all wise, but it's not all unwise either. It's not immoral in that you're causing harm to others. It's all about how you choose to use masturbation. Let's say, for example, you have five or 10 different boyfriends or girlfriends, and now you learned this precept and you're like, hmm, I should probably just have one. But you have these really high sexual cravings. Let's say you use a little bit of masturbation as you're bringing your boyfriends and girlfriends down to one. You use a little bit of masturbation to help you with your sexual cravings so you don't have such extreme sexual cravings. And this helps you get down to just one partner. This is a good use of masturbation. This is actually helping you. But then let's just say you masturbated 15, 20 times a day. This could actually cause your own, your own harm. It's kind of raising up the central desire in your mind. So it's not that masturbation would be all wise, but it's not necessarily all unwise either. Let's say somebody has such a strong sexual craving, they want to go out and rape somebody, but instead they use some masturbation in order to temper their sexual craving and bring it down a bit. This can actually reduce them from causing harm by going out and raping somebody. They might use some masturbation. So sometimes people are taught that masturbation is bad, it's wrong, it's immoral. I wouldn't suggest you think of it that way. It's all about what you're trying to do. If you're working to bring down your sexual craving and your sexual desire, masturbation can be really helpful. But if the masturbation is increasing your sexual desire, that's what you would like to temper and use it in a more wise way. The way that these cravings work is it's kind of like a dam. If you have a physical structure that is a dam and the water is rising up higher and higher on the dam, it's putting pressure on the dam. And one of the things that they do in order to protect the structure of the dam is they open up the dam and they let the water out so that they can release the pressure. Now the water drops back down and then they close the dam again. And now that's the way to protect the dam so the dam doesn't break and it doesn't burst. So as you're choosing to eliminate some of these cravings, you might feel the pressure build building up and building up and building up. And you might need to release some of that pressure. So masturbation can be that way. So if you're trying to either reduce the number of partners that you have, or you're ultimately trying to eliminate sexual craving hundred percent, as you're noticing this craving rising up, you might need to release a little bit of that pressure. And that's where masturbation can come in to help you. And it's being used in a wholesome way to reduce your sexual craving rather than increase it. Sex with animals, this is black and white, is very clear. This is, the uh, animal can't give us consent. Uh, this is why I imagine if people did that, they would get hurt. They would get maybe diseases or illnesses or things like this. So it's really unwise to have sex with animals. And then the last thing you see there is pornography. With pornography, typically what's happening here is an individual has a certain craving and they might have craving for sexual contact. And now you might go down this path of pornography and the mind goes into this fantasy world where the mind might be pleased through pornography and maybe including masturbation and things like this. But oftentimes if you get deep down into that craving and that addiction, it's very challenging to come back out of that. Even when you start having sex with actual people, it can feel not as pleasing anymore because the mind went into this fantasy world. So if you're in a situation where you're craving sexual contact with a person, it would be better to go in that direction rather than going towards pornography. Because once you get into the pornography, it's oftentimes very challenging to get out of that. And you're supporting an industry where people are having sex with multiple, multiple, multiple people. So if you currently have any of these challenges that I'm describing, where there's a lot of sexual craving, there's actually a meditation to help you reduce this and eliminate it in the mind and bring your sexual craving down to something that's more manageable for you. Or if you're interested in completely eliminating your sexual craving, this is a meditation that helps you to completely eliminate it as well. And there you'll feel, find more peace and more joy doing that. But you may or may not be at that point in your life right now. It's up to each individual to decide. So these are some of the things to consider related to this precept. Do you guys have any questions on this one? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thanks. Um I guess I'm worried a little bit about the argumentation from outcome because 
looking at the examples of same-sex partners and transgender individuals, and they're much more likely to have the first part, maybe if it's to men at least, sexual transmitted disease, transgender individuals, health problems, they weigh more both, way more likely to get beaten up, to get murdered, to get experience depression, uh, suicide. So I'm, just because this was used in, in other parts as a reason for why we should stay away from this kind of behavior. So I'm, mm-hmm. I think I'm just like, yeah, just to, to explain a little bit, like is there yeah. another argument maybe coming in here of, mm-hmm. yeah. So all those things you just mentioned, it's not because of a same gender relationship and it's not because of being transgender. It's because of decisions that are being made that produces those things. So more likely to get sexually transmitted diseases. I don't know that that's true or untrue, but if someone's getting sexually transmitted diseases, that's due to making the decision to have sex with multiple people. That's not because they're same, same gender relationship. This is just the, the here. That's not because of the same gender relationship. Being in a same gender relationship, let's just say you met somebody at the age of 20, male, male, female, female, and let's just say you're together for the rest of your life. You're not getting any sexually transmitted diseases. So it's not the same gender relationship that is causing the sexually transmitted disease. It's not the same gender relationship that's causing the depression. If someone's experiencing depression, it's because of craving, desire, attachment in the mind. So all that list that you went through, it's not being caused by the same gender relationship or the transgender individual. That's because of the craving anger and ignorance in the mind making unwise decisions a same gender relationship or be a transgender individual this is just normal this isn't something that someone's choosing like someone's not choosing to be a transgender it's because their mind is experiencing identification with one gender and it ends up in a body that has a different gender that's what's happening as a result of rebirth, right? So they did make a choice to not get to enlightenment the life before, but ending up in a body that has a different gender. This is just the results of rebirth, right? So there's no harm here. There's no harm in the same gender relationship or transgender individual. They haven't caused any harm by having a same gender relationship or being a transgender individual. And all those things that you just mentioned, those can be eliminated through training the mind. Can just check. So when it comes to same-sex partners, so for example, kind of various Christian churches or Christian denominations will say, well, of course, that's not your fault. It's it's not your choice that you are same um, attracted to the same sex. Uh, but here's your choice. You can choose to live that lifestyle right Mm -hmm. um so i'm just wondering whether there's any kind of such distinction here in buddhism as a you know as maybe it's a religious practice as well because i mean you might say the same thing you might say well you know that's not your choice to be um gay but it's still your choice to live the you know to live it out um in some ways so i'm just is there um some reflection of what you very often hear in a Christian context or Christian churches will say, um, or is it different to you? You will certainly find people who are in Buddhist teachings that will tell you that everybody has to have relationships of opposite gender, right? But this is people who aren't understanding the teachings of the Buddha, because the Buddha never taught that. But you will find people that will use any justification, certain cravings that they have to try to impose that on other people, right? So if you get to the natural laws of existence, you understand that everybody makes their own choices in life and whatever people make the choice of, they're experiencing the results of those decisions. Other people's choices don't affect me. What other people choose to do doesn't affect me at all. But with people having craving in their mind, wanting every man to be with a woman and wanting every woman to be with a man, they then get angry. So then they might use something like Jesus teachings or the Buddhist teachings or Prophet Muhammad's teachings to try to justify their cravings of what they want the world to be. They want the world to be all men with a woman and all women with a man. But remember, these teachings aren't explaining to you how the world should be. These teachings are explaining to you the way the world is. The way the world is, is impermanent. Some men are going to be with men. Some men are going to be with women. Some women are going to be with men. Some women are going to be with other women. That's impermanence. And then if you understand the world is with the cycle of rebirth, this helps you to understand the transgender individuals that 
of course we have transgender individuals because not everybody's mind is going to identify with the same gender as their sexual organs in the body. And this comes from the cycle of rebirth and the universal truth of impermanence makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. Anything else on this one? Okay. So let's go to the next one is number four. Abandoning false speech, refraining from false speech, a truth speaker, one to be relied on, trustworthy, dependable, not a deceiver of the world. So here the Buddha is teaching you not to lie, to be trustworthy, to be dependable, right? So oftentimes people will translate this as don't lie, right? So the Buddha is giving you much more illuminating language than that to explain to you the reason why. Because if you're interested in being dependable, reliable, trustworthy, this is going to help you in your personal and professional relationships. Because if you lie, you're going to have a lot of difficulties in those relationships as people discover your lies. The Buddha understood this so well that he didn't even lie when he told a joke. You might not look at a Buddha as someone who tells jokes, but a Buddha tells jokes. They laugh. They have fun. They have a very fulfilling life, right? So oftentimes you see these pictures of the Buddha sitting in meditation. You might think he's somber and silent all the time. That's not true. A enlightened being is going to have a very fulfilling life, very fun, right? So a Buddha tells jokes, but when he tells jokes, he tells them the truth. And it takes a lot more wisdom to be able to tell jokes that are truthful. So if the Buddha was in a class like this, where he was teaching the truth, but then on the side, he was telling jokes that had lies in them, people wouldn't know whether to trust what he was teaching or not. So he practiced such that he always told the truth, even when he told jokes. So this might be more challenging for you, but if you can get your practice to that point, you'll find more and more results in your personal and your professional life. Because not only will people discover that you're untrustworthy and not dependable, but your mind is going to be trying to figure out what did you say to one person versus what did you say to somebody else? You're not going to be able to get to a peaceful and joyful mind if your mind's having to constantly figure out what did you say to one person versus the other to keep your story straight. So by you just speaking the truth all the time, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. You're just always speaking the truth. And this will help you to be reliable and dependable and trustworthy. Worthy. Any questions on this one? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not stealing any questions from you. Um, so I have like two ones. So the first one, very quickly, is I'm wondering that what if you're someone who writes fiction? Not that I do that, but I was mm -hmm. just wondering whether that falls under that in some ways. And maybe the second, because it's related. So there's this very um, kind of a famous example from Immanuel Kant. And um, it's this thought experiment, you know, like you're, um, um, someone comes to your house and they're trying to hide from a murderer and they haven't done anything wrong. The murderer wants to kill them, they're hiding in your house. And um, then the murderer knocks at the door and asks, mm -hmm. is that person there? And what do you do? So, I mean, there's a lot of discussion around that and Manuel Kant mm -hmm. thinks for complex reasons that you should, should, you know, tell the truth. So I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, in this case, whether the Buddha has a different idea or would agree that, mm -hmm. yes, in this case, you need to tell the truth that the person is hiding in your attic or something. Okay, so telling the truth doesn't mean that you expose that this person is in your house when the murderer comes, right? Because if you lied and then the murderer sees that person, now the murderer is going to want to kill you. Right. So you can actually tell the truth without exposing that this person's in your house. So say a murderer comes to me and says, pop, 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 pop. I open my door. Is such and such here? Obviously, this person's going to have to tell you, I want to murder them. Right. It's because that's the only way you're going to know that they're a murderer. And I was like, oh, were you looking for that person? Have you seen them anywhere? Where are they? Right. You can flip it back to them so you can change and redirect the conversation. You don't have to say, oh, yeah, they're in my bedroom underneath the bed. You go get them. Right. So telling the truth in this example doesn't mean that you expose that they're under your bed. It just means that when you speak, you tell the truth. So there's no such thing as a white lie. Some people think that there's such thing as a harmless lie. All lies are going to lead to some unwholesome result. So a common question that people ask, like, what if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend that says, hey, honey, what do you think? How do I look? And you're supposed to say, oh, you look great, right? Well, that might be a, a white lie, right? And, and there's no such thing as a white lie. 
it's harmful. It's harming your mind and it's harming the situation. So in this situation, what the person's doing is they're looking for confidence. They want confidence, right? Like they bought these clothes, they put them on, they're not quite sure how they look and they're looking for your validation. So what I would say in that case is I would say, you know what? All that matters is that you like the clothes. Let's go out and have a good time. I think your smile is beautiful. Let's go out and have a great time. Right? So, so, so for me, at this point in my life, I think everyone's beautiful. I can see beauty in everything, right? So if you're saying, if you're looking at someone and you think that they don't look beautiful, then that's one's mind's own craving, right? So it wouldn't be wise for you to impose your craving on another person, right? So you can just say something like, you know what? I just enjoy spending time with you. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. Let's go have a good time. You can say things like that, right? Rather than lie or rather than kind of take away their confidence, which they're already looking for confidence. And if you tell them that they don't look good, you're going to just take away their confidence. Instead, support them, lift them up, right? You don't need to impose your cravings onto them. So that's what I would suggest you do. Same thing like with the murder coming to your house, you can speak about something else. I forget the first part of what you said. Oh, fiction. So when you're writing fiction, it's labeled as fiction. People know it's a story, that it's an invented story, that these things didn't happen. It's very clear what this is. In that situation, there's no lie, right? That they're being truthful that this is a fictional story. Mm -hmm. Same thing when you're acting as well. Yeah. Sorry, I actually wrote this down a little while ago and then Mm -hmm. talking about truthful speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, Just in terms of sometimes when we speak truthfully, people don't receive it very well. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I feel like it would perhaps come across as unwholesome because that's their perception. So then they might start feeling their own suffering, which I understand is not because of you, but it's because of your actions that they're now feeling that. So obviously there's a sense of accountability for that person to own that that's their own desires and attachment. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm just curious as to whether that's still karma in terms Mm -hmm. of your actions are causing an unwholesome reaction. Mm -hmm. So you didn't cause the unwholesome reaction? Right. So it's an individual's craving, anger and ignorance that is producing their unwholesome or unskillful conduct. This is unwise. But even if you yelled and hollered and screamed at somebody, if they got angry, it's their mind that's causing that. Now, because you were angry, yelling and hollering, that's what's going to potentially come back to you. Right. So that's the results of your decisions. But what you learn more and more on this path is you learn how to speak in ways and how to function in ways where people are less likely to get angry around you, but it's still possible for them to get angry and you're not causing that. So whenever somebody chooses to get angry or hostile or bitter, Understand that it's always their mind is causing it, but it would always be wise to look at what you did and how you could potentially improve to, for that to be less likely to occur. So I'll give you an example. About a month ago, there was a, a person who came and studied with me in just like a, a two hour class. And then they were telling me that they were quite lonely and, and they were here and they were feeling quite sad because they came to visit a friend and their friend didn't have time to spend time with them. And they wanted to go look at all these temples and they didn't have anybody to go look at these temples with. And I was like, oh, I'll take you to go see these temples if you'd like to go. I'll, I'll hang out with you for a day and take you around and tour you around. And they're like, oh, perfect. So we went around for a day and I showed them a whole bunch of temples. And then they said, OK, I would like to come see you next week and have lunch with you. And I was like, sure come after class. We finish up at 12 o'clock. It was a Wednesday, I think, or something like that, or a Saturday. And we'll go out to lunch. Well, they came at 1130. They hang out for a little while. Class was still going on. Class was over at 12. And then there were students who came up and talked with me. So I was helping the students and they were just kind of waiting over there politely and calmly. But by about 12, 10, 12, 15, they were getting really upset and it was visible and they were starting to be a little bit aggressive in the way that they were talking and talking to me. And eventually they started being very hostile and aggressive. And I was like, you know, I I think it's better that we don't go to lunch today. I think you need to maybe spend a little bit of time calming down and we can catch up another time. And uh, they got really angry and bitter and hostile, right? And And they left. So at that point, even though I know that they caused their own anger, 
I still needed to look at my own actions and what did I do that can potentially be improved so that this person's attachment won't get triggered in the future. So what I did is I looked at the text messages where we organized this lunch and I was like, what did I say? And I was like, okay, we'll meet it after class and so forth and so on. But normally what I add to that is I usually say around 12. Or I might say like, you know, just be aware that there might be some students after class that will need to talk to me. So we'll need to have lunch around 12. And I didn't do it that time. So I didn't cause that person's anger. He, he caused it himself from his craving. And ultimately he, his result was, hey, I'm not going to go eat lunch with you. you know, that'd be the last thing I would be interested in doing if someone was craving and attached is to go have lunch with this person and reinforce their attachment. So still in that situation though it's wise to look at what you did to be able to figure out like what can i do to improve my practice here a bit and make this less likely to occur in the future and that's very rare like that's probably once in a year that something like that happens around me because i'm functioning in a way that i'm observant of people's cravings and attachments and i'm ensuring that none of those are getting triggered in the way that I'm practicing and the way that I'm making decisions. So you can get to that same point if you always look at your own practice, but always remember that when someone else is getting discontent, they're causing it themselves. But what conditions existed that maybe you contributed to craving getting triggered? And even if it's only 1%, like in that situation, it was like a sliver of a thing that I could have done differently. But you learn that and then you can improve and then you can improve in the future. But when they were getting angry and upset, I wasn't experiencing any sadness or anger or frustration at all because my mind wasn't craving to go to lunch with that person. I was there to help them if they would like, but I wasn't craving it. So you can still get to the point where you protect your mind. You've eliminated your discontentedness, but there might be some things that you can do a little bit differently to improve the results that are being experienced. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just also curious as to any wording that you would recommend in terms of, I feel like it's quite common in society to say like, I'm sorry. Mm. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, this is great for this particular precept of speaking the truth, because oftentimes you're, you might be seeing other people say that, like, I'm sorry, I caused you to feel that way. That's unwise. It's not true. And that's what speaking the truth is, because if you speak this way around your friends, around your family, around your coworkers, you're going to have lots of people blaming you for their feelings because as soon as they don't feel a certain way, they're going to blame you because you've been taking responsibility for their feelings. So if you start speaking the truth more and more readily, you'll start noticing that you'll have better results in your relationships around you. So what I would say instead of that is I might say, I'm sorry that you feel that way. Or it's unfortunate that you feel that way. That's what I was saying to this gentleman when he was here. He was blaming me for all of his feelings. And I said, it's very unfortunate that you feel that way. It's interesting because the week before he learned the Four Noble Truths, right? But learning it and practicing it in the moment is two different things. So even though he had learned the Four Noble Truths, he wasn't practicing it. So he was blaming me for all of his feelings. So I was just saying, you know, it's very unfortunate that you feel that way. You know, maybe you need to spend some time thinking about those and realize that I'm not the one that's causing your feelings. So I said that with him because he was someone who had learned the Four Noble Truths. But if it was somebody who hadn't learned the Four Noble Truths, I probably wouldn't have said that last part. Because oftentimes if you tell people I'm not causing your feelings, they'll get more angry, right? They'll get more mad. So this is where like the variables are always different. So you're not going to have this one standard stock answer that you can permanently do. But saying things like, it's unfortunate that you feel that way. I'm sorry that you're feeling that way. You know, those kinds of things, those can be helpful because it's showing that you understand their feelings, but you're not taking responsibility for their feelings. Don't ever take responsibility for someone else's feelings because then you're going to have a lot of people blaming you for their feelings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, last year, I made some decisions that changed my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to tell to my friends, so I told them a lot of lies. Mm -hmm. because I, Just because I don't want their opinions uh, affect myself, and I want to keep my, me um, peaceful. Um, but 
I feel so sorry for my friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's because you're craving your attachment, wanting them to be a certain way. So if you're looking to not be affected by what your friends are saying, then just move on from the conversation or when they're talking, just don't pay attention to it, right? Or just change the subject or something like that because you can only be influenced by the things you allow your mind to be influenced by. If you have wisdom and you know what's wise and what's unwise, you can't be influenced by anything at all. This is the challenge in the unenlightened mind is that oftentimes we conform to what's going on around us. We just conform to what other people say, what other people do. But if you have wisdom and you can see the truth, you can get to the point where you know what is wise and what is unwise. And it doesn't matter what people say to you, you know the wise decision. So this actually ties into the next precept of substances that cause heedlessness. There was a point in time in my life where I really enjoyed dancing and I would go out dancing, but I was done with alcohol and liquor and and all that kind of stuff. So when I would go out to places dancing with my friends, they would be drinking beer and wine and whiskey and all these kinds of things. And I would order water at a bar, right? And they would laugh at me. They would joke at me. They would mock me. They would say all these bad things. I would just smile because I know that they are the ones that are going to experience the headache the next day with the hangover. And I was going to be out doing all kinds of wonderful things because I'm not drinking alcohol and I can have a great time. There were even times where I would go out partying and I would be drinking my water and having such a good time. People would be like, what are you taking, man? You, you have you have any drugs? Like, what is that? Is that is that that new ecstasy? Is that that new this or that? And I'm like, no, I'm drinking water, buddy. <laughs> They're like, how do you do that? How do you have so much fun by just drinking water? So yeah, so you, so you'll get people that will try to influence you potentially in a negative way or unwholesome ways. And if you know what's wise and unwise, then you know like. Don't drink alcohol. Don't take substances that cause heedlessness. Don't do these kinds of things because it would be very unwise. So even though other people might be sharing things with you, anytime someone's sharing unsolicited advice with you, unsolicited guidance, right away, you should discount that because that's their craving. That's their longing to share things with you and push their way of being. They're trying to push it into your life. So if you're getting unsolicited guidance and unsolicited advice from people right away. Be suspicious of that because that's coming from their craving. And it's also coming from their ego. A certain amount of ego needs to be involved in order to share advice with someone in an unsolicited way. So even though I know all these teachings and you guys see that I'm teaching you guys in these classes, if I'm going outside to the park and I see somebody doing something that's unwise, I don't walk over to them and be like, hey, by the way, the Buddha taught Da, 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 da. Right? Like, no, because they're not interested in learning from me. So I'm only going to teach people who come to the temple and who are interested in learning or who ask me advice. So if you get to a point where you have friends or family that are pushing their advice into your life, that's their craving and that's their ego. And right away, you should just ignore that or change the subject or move on to something else because it's not coming from a wise decision. And anytime somebody's functioning through craving and anytime they're functioning through ego, it's producing unwholesome results for them. So therefore, if you adopt what they're saying to you, it's going to produce unwholesome results for you as well. So if you eliminate your craving and attachment to your friends and your family, you can get to the point where you understand like, okay, I can just ignore that. I don't need to adopt what they're telling me to do. And if they're trying to force you to do something, it's very unwise to do those things because you're just showing them, yeah, the more you force me to do something or try to force me, I'm going to do what you say. And then they're just going to keep doing that over and over and over again. Yeah, but it's... That's why you need the Eightfold Path. You need the meditation. You need all the other teachings to learn because with your mind having craving, it will be hard for you to ignore it because your mind has attachment. But when you purify your mind, you'll be able to ignore these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, so this is the fifth precept. Refraining from strong drink and sloth producing drugs, substances that cause heedlessness, the basis for heedlessness. So if you're investigating and examining the teachings of the Buddha, the first thing you might ask yourself is what does heedlessness mean? 
right? And look in a dictionary. Well, I've done that and I'm providing the here for you, but don't believe what I'm sharing. Look it up for yourself if you like. What heedlessness means is careless, thoughtless, inattentive, uncalm, unaware, or unmindful. If you're looking to purify your mind and get to this enlightened mental state where you can observe the unwholesome qualities and eliminate those from the mind and you're cultivating wholesome qualities in your mind, if you're putting a substance that calls heedlessness in your in your body, this is doing just the opposite of what you're trying to accomplish on the path to enlightenment. You're trying to cultivate mindfulness. You're trying to cultivate awareness of mind. You're trying to purify your mind. So if you take substances that are going to produce heedlessness, this is walking in the opposite direction of enlightenment. And we were talking a little bit about this the other day with substances like psychedelics and things like this. But now let's go through this list. So there's a gray area here, right? It's not all black and white because something like marijuana, yes, it produces heedlessness and someone might take it for that purpose, but it also produces medical benefits too. But it's all about how you use this plant. If you're looking for a high, someone's probably going for a high THC and they might be smoking it. And this is causing damage to the lungs and it's causing difficulties in the mind. But if you're having a true medical reason to take marijuana, you're probably going to look for a high CBD. This is a certain portion of the plant that has a high CBD and you're probably going to take it as an edible or an oil or something like that. So it doesn't cause harm to the lungs. So there's children who have like 20 different seizures in one day and they've given them a little drop of CBD oil and then they don't have a seizure for six months. So we know that this plant has medical benefits, but it's all about how you're using it and why you're using it. And then if you're using it for something like stress or anxiety, this isn't going to solve that problem. Some people think that that's a medical thing and that they're going to solve it with marijuana, but it actually doesn't solve it because what's causing the stress and anxiety is the craving desire attachment. So if you are introducing marijuana and maybe you don't feel stress in that moment when you're ingesting the marijuana and as you're high on the marijuana, but when the marijuana is gone, you're stressed and you're anxious. So you haven't cultivated the wisdom of how to eliminate the stress and anxiety through eliminating cravings, desires, attachments. So marijuana, you can use it for medical purposes, but you would look for a high CBD and probably ingest it as an oil or an edible. Cigarettes, there's no medical benefit there. And the people have figured this out. And this is why we have all kinds of difficulties with cancers and lung cancers and stuff like this. So less and less people are smoking. So if you currently smoke, you might decide to let that go over time because it's going to help improve your health. Then you need to look at some of the prescription medicines that you take because, of course, medicines can be very beneficial. They provide medical benefit, but some of them can be addicting as well. So if a doctor prescribes you medicine, you probably would like to research that a bit and see if it has any addictive properties. And if it does, you might ask them for a different medicine. Or if there's no other medicine, it's only that particular medicine that you can use. You might decide to hurry up and get off of it as soon as possible so you don't get addicted to it. So you need to look at those kinds of things. And then look at caffeine as well, because caffeine produces heedlessness. There's no medical benefit for caffeine. It produces this excited state in the mind. It lifts up the energy. It's a stimulant. And if you let go of caffeine, you'll notice that you can produce natural energy. By the time you get to enlightenment, you have consistent energy all throughout your day. An enlightened being doesn't get exhausted. They don't get tired. They get sleepy. They need to sleep, but they don't get exhausted or tired. If you continue to rely on a substance like caffeine to lift you up, then you're going to drop off when you don't have the caffeine. But if you can purge that out of your food intake, you can cultivate natural energy where your mind is just always energetic, uh, not bouncing off the wall, but not down here and tired and exhausted either. So if you continue to ingest caffeine, you're not going to be able to cultivate that natural energy with the body and with the mind. So if you decide to let go of caffeine, I suggest doing that gradually or slowly, because if you try to do things abruptly, oftentimes the mind doesn't like that. So if you do it gradually, it'll help you a lot more. You even need to look at sugar intake. If you take sugar in excess, you can go into a sugar high. We probably did that when we were a child. And then you drop off down into, you know, after the sugar high. So if you're going to ingest sugar, you can ingest sugar. There's no harm with sugar by itself. But if you take it in excess, that's where it's going to produce the heedlessness.
And then the last one you see here is psychedelic substances, which we talked about the other day, psychedelic mushrooms or LSD or ayahuasca. This is oftentimes thought of as people think that it's actually helping you to become more conscious and have a higher consciousness. It does promote a certain amount of introspection where you can look inward at the mind, but it's being induced by a substance rather than you cultivating that naturally. What you would like to do is be able to cultivate that through training of the mind because in order to get to enlightenment, you're going to need to be introspective at all different times of the day. As you experience different things, you're going to need to be reflective about what it is that you're experiencing. If you can only be reflective when you take this substance, then you're not going to be able to be reflective all throughout your day and look inward and try to figure out what is it that's causing your discontentedness or was I really loving and kind here or was it, is there something I can do to change my practice here? So you're going to need to produce that inward looking eye, that introspection, that reflectiveness. And if you cultivate that naturally, then you'll have that available to you all throughout your day. It'll be permanent in the mind. By the time an enlightened being gets to enlightenment, there can be permanently reflective. But as a psychedelic substance, you can only be reflective when you have that substance. And you're hindering the mind from being able to cultivate that, to be able to have it as a quality of the mind that's always there. So that's why I would suggest that you you eliminate any kind of psychedelic substances if you're looking to cultivate this mindfulness and awareness of mind. So anything on this one that you guys would like to talk about? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I feel like it's a lot about the sort of amount as well. Uh, you can take any amount almost uh, <laughs> that we're consuming uh, and will cause uh, heallessness. Like you can drink water and become <laughs> like dizzy. And, uh, um, so it's more like the heedlessness we're trying to avoid. If you sleep too little, uh, you are become heedless and, and uh, stuff like that. So, can you like, give me an example? Like which yeah, one? Yeah, if you don't sleep enough, right? You can. What's be, that? If you don't sleep enough, oh, you become heedless. And you said that with the sugar, you come, mm -hmm. you take too much sugar, become heedless, and mm -hmm. caffeine same, and the psychedelics, even like yeah, with the ayahuasca and the, the DMT, we have it within our brain, right? So if we uh, take too much of that and mm -hmm. we become heedless so all these different things you can take too much become heedless and you become a bit, uh, lower and becomes kind of balanced okay. so a few things i share with you there is is sleep isn't a substance that causes heedlessness this is an activity that you need in order to restore the mind and restore the body and maintain its health so that's not what we're talking about here what we're, yeah. what we're talking about here is, is substances that yeah. you're putting into the body. There's really only two purposes to put substances into the body, or actually three, but two main ones, which is putting food into the body to nourish the body, putting liquids into the body to hydrate the body. But then there's also medicines, right, that we put into the body to heal the body as well. When you're starting to induce these different substances like alcohol. And by the way, this isn't an exhaustive list here that I have. I'm not putting together an exhaustive list for you. I'm just helping you to understand this precept and then giving you a couple of examples that you can use because that tends to be kind of a gray area. So certain substances that you put into the body, it's going to produce heedlessness and you need to be attentive to this. In some cases, something like alcohol or cocaine or crystal meth or heroin, you know, like this is producing heedlessness. That's the only purpose to put that into the body. But there's other purposes for something like marijuana. It can be put in the body for heedlessness, but it can also be put into the body for medical purposes. And that's what you'd like to look at. Same thing with something like a prescription medicine. This is being put into the body for, for the most part for healing. Mm. But some of these prescription medicines can be for the purpose of heedlessness as well. But you take something like caffeine, there's no medical purpose for caffeine. It doesn't hydrate you. It doesn't nourish the body. There's no need for caffeine in the body whatsoever. Mm. So you can actually purge this a hundred percent from the body. Mm. When you look at something like sugar, this can actually be helpful to the body in, in certain amounts. But if you take it in excess, this is one of those substances that, yeah, it can produce heedlessness. Mm. So 
what you're doing on this path is it's not like a plug and play kind of thing where everything's going to conform to one particular thing. Moving to this higher consciousness is to cultivate wisdom so that you can look at a particular substance and then you can figure out whether it would be wise or unwise for you to take it. So if you notice the way that the Buddha teaches is he teaches in a way that's timeless, that this teaching can be applied all throughout time because the Buddha could have never known that we were going to invent LSD because that's chemical based or PC. CP, or now we have a synthetic marijuana that's being created, right? He would have never known that we were creating those kinds of things. What he's teaching you here is don't interject, interject something into the body that's going to promote the mind to be unmindful or unaware because what you need to get yeah. to is you need to get to the mindfulness and the awareness of mind. So if there's any substance either now or long into the future, 10,000 years from now, 80,000 years from now, something is invented that gets uh, interjected into the body and now it produces heedlessness, it would be unwise to take that substance. And then as you're saying, which is what I shared as well, some substances at certain levels are heedlessness, some substances are not. And that's what you'll need to monitor. And then one more thing that I'll share here, because I, I, I see this potentially. Let me share this. Sometimes the way the unenlightened mind functions is when it's doing certain things now and then it learns teachings of what the Buddha is pointing to as what this is enlightenment. Sometimes the mind really struggles to be able to see that and be willing to let go of what it's currently doing in order to get to this peaceful and joyful mental state. The mind is a master at justifying its current decisions, whether it's about euthanasia, whether it's about substances, whether it's about anything that we might be doing, the mind will oftentimes justify what it's doing now because it wants to hold on to these cravings and this clinging. And it's not willing to see the potential of what it can get to if it lets go of these things. So I'm not sure if there's any of that potentially, but sometimes people have that around substances. It's like, ah, oh, can't I just keep my coffee? Like, gosh, I just want my coffee every morning. Gosh, I really want that. I'm not going to tell you to keep your coffee. I'm not going to tell you to get rid of your coffee. What I'm sharing with you is that if you drink coffee, if you drink caffeine, it's going to promote heedlessness. You're not going to be able to see the quality of your mind as well. And you might even notice that it produces headaches and dry mouth and all these other things. So that's the results of one's decisions. Yeah. So I'm not sure what your follow-up so, question yeah, so, is. So my point is that the, it's the heedlessness we're trying to avoid. We're mm -hmm. going to talk about drinking water and uh, sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, marijuana is a plant, so is lettuce. Mm -hmm. And so is uh, a mushroom, uh, mm -hmm. like normal mushroom or magic mushroom, doesn't mm -hmm. matter, right? And that's part of the vegan diet. So um, it's a matter of amount of the plants and, and ultimately it's the, the heedlessness we're trying to avoid. The magic mushroom that you're referring to, yeah. there's only one reason to take that. That's psychedelic experience, right? If Is lettuce it, produced sure? that, I would suggest not to eat lettuce. But lettuce doesn't produce that, so I, I, we can. Isn't it like a, a spectrum of, of like a million different uh, plants, and, and some induce some heedlessness, and some don't. With something like sugar, there's that spectrum, right? But with something like a psychedelic mushroom, there's no spectrum there. If you take the psychedelic mushroom, you're going to experience a psychedelic experience, mm, right? Not necessarily. Well. If you're not, then why would you take it? I mean, you can take small amounts. There's like microdosing stuff. So, so, so you can take them very You small. do what you think is best yeah, yeah, for yeah. you. <laughs> I would advise you to not take psychedelic mushrooms. Yeah. And if you'd like to eat lettuce, eat all the lettuce you like. I'm just saying it's, it's a spectrum. And, and yeah. it's not about it, substance in itself. It's yeah. the heat. Yeah. So if the mind has the intention of, I would like to take this psychedelic substance because it's going to produce a psychedelic experience. That's your intention behind it. You're walking in the opposite direction of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in getting to mindfulness or awareness of mind, you would purge all substances because you have no use for a psychedelic substance whatsoever. There's just no way that an enlightened being is ever going to pick up a psychedelic substance once they're at, once you they're enlightened. You don't think we can eat lettuce to heedlessness? No, you let us, so? I don't no think let us produce this heedlessness. <laughs> if it did, yeah. I would say whatever that amount is, yeah. then don't take it, right? Yeah. But yeah, psychedelic... So, so then it's the amount and, and the, the, the scale in a way. Or, yeah. 
there's no purpose to drink to take a psychedelic substance. Maybe take the three. You know, let let us. You know, so so if you would like to hold on to your psychedelic substances, by all means, you'll experience the results of that. But I'm not going to ever take a psychedelic substance ever again. I did in the past when I was younger. There's no reason for me to have that at this point. You're hindering yourself from experiencing enlightenment as long as you hold on to that psychedelic substance. You won't experience enlightenment. It's not about whether it's a plant or not. It's about the effects that it's producing to your mind, right? At the end of the day, alcohol is a plant too, right? It's a plant as well. It's about the effect that it's causing to your mind. Yeah. That's what you're trying to eliminate. If you would like to get to enlightenment, you're going to need mindfulness and you're going to need a from the moment you start waking up until the moment you fall asleep, you're going to need mindfulness. And if at any point during there, you're introducing a substance that's producing heedlessness, you're not going to be able to experience enlightenment. And they stop taking it because they want that high, right? They might switch to something else. Yeah. I mean, I assume because it doesn't have this effect on them in particular, whether they take it or not, it doesn't matter in context, but typically most people will have Right. So you're trying to eliminate heedlessness. Yeah. If you're interested in getting to enlightenment and you would like to cultivate mindfulness, then eliminate substances that cause heedlessness. And that's going to take time for you to gradually get to that point. You may not be at that point right now. Some people might continue to ingest caffeine. That's fine. I go out with students. They invite me to a coffee shop. They're like, hey, David, let's talk. I meet them at a coffee shop. They drink coffee. They're not hurting me. They're not causing any harm to me. I'll drink my smoothie. I'll drink my water. If somebody invited me to a psychedelic party, I'd probably say, you know, you guys enjoy. You know, I'll be at the temple whenever you'd like to learn. Come on by. Right. But these kinds of things, it's affecting you. Right. And, and the more that your mind lets go, you can see more and more clarity that these psychedelic substances aren't needed. The caffeine's not needed. These highs that these substances are producing, it's not needed. If you're getting to this peace and joy, that's what's ultimately going to be sustaining in the mind. You have another question? It's amazing how you guys just forget about lunch. And I see some of you guys fading though. I think you, I think you need some food, right? Why don't we talk about this at lunch? You and I can can walk together and, and go somewhere. I want some lunch. Uh, yeah. Why don't we do oh. that so that people can, because this has been a great conversation. I, I can sit here until midnight or even 5 a.m. if you'd like. We can sit here for, you know, 100 hours and keep talking and talking. But I'm just thinking that why don't we break for lunch so that I see a couple of people kind of fading and there's some people showing up to learn walking meditation because I told people that it would be two o'clock that we would be uh, studying walking meditation. So we need to figure out how much of a lunch break we actually need because we're way past our normal lunch time. How much of a lunch break do you guys need? Half an hour. You guys are good with a half an hour. Okay. So it's one forty-two. So how about we pick it up at two fifteen, and I will start with walking meditation at two fifteen. Okay. Thank you guys for your questions. I think this is great. But at some point, we gotta go to lunch. <laughs> All right. Those of you guys online, we'll see you next time. We're gonna be live streaming the walking meditation at two fifteen. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.